Hello, Agora IO. And I would like to just start off by testing. Uh, my name is Stephanie Murphy, first of all. Um, I'm watching the chat. Can everybody hear me okay and see me okay? Somebody please uh, give an indication. Okay, looks like I got the thumbs up. So I'm going to just proceed with my talk. Cool. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming to see my talk today. And uh, I hope everybody's been having a great time at Agora IO. I really enjoyed the last one and I enjoy I'm enjoying this one. And oh hi. I I'm there's a little bit of a delay, but I'm getting everything that's coming across in the chat and just want to say hello to everybody who said hi in there. Thank you very much. Um so for those of you who aren't familiar with who I am, um, my name is Stephanie Murphy, and I am a activist and uh, liberty lover in New Hampshire. I moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project, or to participate in the Free State Project, and I do a lot of activism, uh, mostly media and kind of outreach type stuff, but a really important part of the activism that I do is also uh, the touches on the concept of mutual aid and trying to help others and, and kind of uh, erode the state by doing so. And that's why I titled my talk, uh, as you see uh, at today's conference, Eroding the State with Mutual Aid. So I'm going to be talking a lot about helping others today and uh, the concept of mutual aid and a little bit of history there, too, and how I think it can help us as part of the liberty movement. And uh, relevant to this talk, I should mention that uh, I, I said I'm an activist here in New Hampshire and um, uh, activist for liberty, of course. And I'm also a co-organizer of the mutual aid organization Free Aid, and that's spelled FR33 Aid. Uh, so FR33Aid.com is the website you can go to if you would like to learn more about us and and what we do. And of course, I will uh, reiterate this at the end of the talk as well. But if you enjoy my talk today, uh, please don't give any money to me. But I would suggest that. Uh, you give a small donation to free aid if you'd like to help us provide volunteer first aid at different liberty oriented events and put out education out there about uh, health and wellness and how it relates to liberty and how we can all help each other become better uh, more healthy people so oh and I see that uh, Nick has posted fr33aid.com the URL in the chat room and thank you very much for that so Okay, today I'm going to be talking, as I mentioned, about uh, mutual aid and how it relates to liberty. I will try to make sure that um, I have lots of time for questions. This won't be a particularly long talk, so hopefully we can have kind of a dialogue as we go along in the chat and on this video. And uh, I just want to start off by asking you a question, and that is, like, how often have you been having conversation about liberty? with a friend or a family member who may be new to the ideas or hasn't heard them before and they'll say something like it'll come down to this it'll come down to like if we didn't have a government who, who would take care of the poor who would help out people who need help and who would kind of be the social safety net that everybody needs at some time in their life usually almost everybody needs um, and it's a great question I think it's one of the biggest questions that we face as people who are interested in freedom and self-government. Uh, somebody's saying Rhodes in the chat, and I think actually Rhodes kind of ties into this, but I'm talking about social services and stuff like medication, you know, uh, medical care, that kind of thing, um, savings, I guess financial stability, especially when people are older and they don't have maybe the same income that they do as a young person, um, protection services, um, all kinds of stuff like that, Day, you know, child care, family help, um, maybe services uh, related to mental health and drug addiction and that kind of thing. So, so who would provide those things and how would those people get the help that they need in the absence of a government? And you know what, I think there might be a little bit of an echo, so I'm just going to remedy that real quick. Cool. Okay, I hope that gets better for you all. <laughs> I could kind of hear myself broadcasting again. I did just want to make sure that uh, the audio quality is good on this talk. Okay, so yeah, how do you address that question? I think it's a really important one, and I think it gets at, psychologically, it gets at a lot of people's fears about self-government or about a society that is uh, stateless, you know, the absence of a coercive monopoly that claims to be the only one who can legitimately provide these services and must do so by force, by 
by forcing everybody else to pay for them and collecting taxes from them against their consent. Um, so, you know, how do we go up against that? How do we compete with that? And I think that uh, the, answer, the answer to that question is uh, can be found in organizations that are already existing today and that have existed historically uh, throughout history, just examples of people getting together. And I also think that we can make a good case that the state is really not the friend of the poor and kind of downtrodden people in society, maybe marginalized groups, um, people like women, minorities, you know, non-heterosexual, that kind of thing. Historically, the state really has not been their friend and really has not been there for them to provide the services that a lot of people want and, and need and require. So, um, you know, oftentimes when you're having those conversations with friends and family, coworkers, that kind of thing, and, you know, you try to explain to them that maybe in the absence of a, a, a coercive state, you know, in the absence of a monopoly on providing those services, people would get together and help each other and that there would be uh, mutual aid organizations like credit unions, self-help organizations, charities, fraternities, fraternal organizations, uh, medical charities, me philanthropic organizations, clubs, churches, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, benefit societies is another one that comes to mind. When you say that those things uh, would emerge, people often, I think, um, at least I've encountered this, have trouble conceptualizing how those organizations would kind of uh, rush in in a decentralized way to kind of fill the void that would be left in the absence of a state providing those services. And people often don't realize that a lot of those type of organizations exist in today's world and in fact they're doing a lot already to help people and in fact people don't realize how much they probably rely on mutual aid in their own communities and in their own lives and so I'm going to talk a little bit today about a broad definition of mutual aid and sort of um, things that you might not have thought uh, could classify as mutual aid but in fact they are so I think a lot of people are familiar with uh, throughout history there were a lot of organizations that uh, mostly made up of people who were kind of marginalized in some way and they would band together to help each other out and the classic example of this was sort of these immigrant communities where in the early history of the US there were a lot of um, different populations of immigrants that would kind of gather in certain cities and they would live in close quarters and they would kind of uh, cooperate to uh, take care of educating their children and child care and uh, even helping each other out when they got sick or if somebody needed some help, all kinds of stuff like that. So a lot of people are familiar with that and may even be pr familiar with the history of private education in the U.S. Where, uh, whereby a lot of people had these schools that were almost a lot based on kind of unschooling type concepts, you know, like the children would kind of uh, direct the curriculum a little bit more than they do today in the traditional government schools and older children would help teach the younger children and they were structured in such a way that children of many different ages would be in the same classroom together kind of helping each other learn and the tuition was extremely low you know I, I've heard statistics like it was you know ninety dollars a year in today's dollars if you look at these some of these private schools where the older children were helping out the younger children and you know I, I kinda wanted to steer a, a little bit away from talking about the history of mutual aid in the US today because there have been a lot of other people who have done this a lot better than me and I, I just want to mention some resources real quick um, if you want to learn more about the historical examples of mutual aid and kind of the ways that the state has eroded those organizations and usurped them and marginalized them you can check out um, an interesting talk by Sheldon Richmond that he gave at the Foundation for Economic Education there's a great talk about mutual aid and uh, the history of mutual aid in the US and also David um, Beto wrote a book called From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State and I think it, it was written a while ago it should probably be updated and I'm not sure if there is a um, updated version of that book but the the old one is pretty good and it really goes over a lot of the historical organizations uh, that go back through time and have been helping people for uh, for a really long time and they were all voluntary none of them relied on force you know and they were all structured in in a lot of different ways but I will get to that oh and also um, just want to mention briefly too if you're particularly interested in the history of education in the US Brett the Nod on the School Sucks podcast has a couple of shows 
that talk about the history of voluntary education in the U.S. and they're they're very good. They're they're really fascinating. And I think that if you do encounter someone who is curious about these things, um, sending them those resources can really help. But you can also talk to them one on one and give them examples of these mutual aid organizations that exist today. And so, you know, I was thinking about mutual aid. I guess I haven't really defined it uh, today. But what I mean when I say mutual aid, I take a broad definition and basically that is just people getting together and helping one another in any realm that involves like a social need, I guess you could say. So there's my working definition of mutual aid. And I think that there are a lot of organizations that fall under this umbrella that do already exist and none of them uh, rely on government force. For instance, um, one of the first ones I thought of was uh, credit unions. You know, it's kind of like a co-op style banking institution or financial institution. So that could be a mut an example of mutual aid in the in the financial realm. Um, the second thing I thought of were self-help organizations, group therapy or something like Alcoholics Anonymous or similar organizations for people who are trying to kick addictions, kind of get off those things. There are also group homes for people who have mental illness where they can live together and get sort of group therapy and uh, do work around the places and kind of support themselves in that way and, and rely on each other. Uh, there are daycare co-ops. And in fact, I mean, most people would be surprised. I think of this as mutual aid when parents get together and form like a carpooling co-op. I'm sure you know somebody who, who does that, right? I'm sure you know a lot of people who do that. I think that's mutual aid. They are getting together to help each other serve a social need and they're doing it in a voluntary fashion without relying on the government. And of course, there are, um, in some places, there are government um, daycare services, but there are lots of different problems with them. The biggest one is that they're funded by force, and you know, other big ones are that they maybe provide substandard services, or you know, sometimes they're not able to watch all the kids that they have under their control, and you know, everybody has to pay for them whether they have children or not. So, you know, carpooling and and childcare co-ops are a great example of uh, voluntary mutual aid coming to fruition in people's lives. Another one that I think a lot of people have experience with is something like a condo association, you know. Um, and some of these organizations that I'm mentioning, um, you know, you might think, well, oh, homeowners association or condo association, they can be pretty authoritarian. And in some cases, that's true. It, it probably depends on the individual one. And they are relying on some sort of state structures, I guess, like the legal system to uh, be in place. But, you know, a condo association can be also uh, an example of a neighborhood watch, you know, where there are people who keep an eye on the neighborhood and look out for crime. And in, in a lot of cases, that can be way more effective than police patrols at deterring criminals, break-ins, assaults, that kind of thing. Um, there are organizations, uh, and, and you know, of course, one more thing to mention about homeowners associations, you know, there are some of them that collect these these dues and stuff, is essentially a membership fee, and then when someone's roof caves in or whatever, they will uh, spend the money out of that fund to fix it, and part of buying into that organization is that when, if that happens to your home, then you can be assured that uh, the association will help cover the expenses. So. I think it's interesting and important to think of organizations like that, like a homeowners association or a child care co-op or, uh, you know, anything like that as a mutual aid organization because it shows people uh, about the provision of these kind of services on a really small scale and people can also really relate to it because a lot of them have participated in those organizations at some point in their lives. Uh, another example of mutual aid today that I thought of is uh, kind of these uh, these women's organizations that are um, maybe provide places for women to go in cases where they've been experiencing domestic violence and there are a lot of these there's a lot of them local to me which I you know this is a national talk anybody can see it so I won't mention the particular ones but I pretty much guarantee that there is one of them near you um, and it just shows that you know often the state is no friend to women in particular um, you know, when they experience domestic violence, the police are not the best ones to handle that situation. They'll often make arrests. Uh, sometimes they arrest the wrong people. They often show up too late. Uh, and they can't really help with these social issues of, you know, the all the things that are involved in abusive relationships and people's complicated home dynamics. And so it's great that, that there are mutual aid organizations to kind of step up and fill that need and kind of help 
help women who have don't get that kind of help from organizations like police. Um, another example that is really familiar to a lot of people is private hospitals. I mean, there are lots of children's hospitals in particular because I think that a lot of people, uh, you know, feel this uh, endearment towards children, right? And they want to help them out, especially when they have things like uh, cleft palate or cleft lip, which are kind of easy to fix surgically, and uh, you know, maybe childhood cancers. And for example, I was researching this and I found the uh, the Shriners Children Ho Children's Hospitals are an interesting example. They're a network of private hospitals where um, basically they subsist on an endowment and on some donations and they fix uh, issues like this in childhood like kind of like cleft lip and cancer are a couple of the ones that they focus on and they're only requirements for uh, helping children at no cost to the children's families are that the condition be treatable and the child be under 18. So you know that's a pretty not very stringent requirement for receiving their help and so I'm going to get into the ways that different mutual aid organizations are structured in a, in a few minutes, but I think it's really interesting to see examples like that. And uh, a lot of people know about children's hospitals that provide this kind of help, but there are adult ones too, to be sure, to be sure. And you know, even families, I think, can be considered a example of mutual aid. I mean, how many times have 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 you heard or maybe experienced yourself of people asking their parents for help? Uh, going to live with their parents when they're in a time when they're down and out or asking their parents for money or uh, you know the parents give an old car to the children to help them out or something like that and it goes both ways too when the parents get older sometimes they come to live with the children and so families can be wonderful examples of mutual aid uh, support networks as well so um, and if you're in New Hampshire if you're if you're watching this talk um, you know there's the Free State Project up in New Hampshire there's a huge um, community of people who are interested in the ideas of liberty and there are starting to be mutual aid organizations that are springing up here and they're taking care of functions like there's the Civil Disobedience Evolution Fund which people voluntarily contribute to and they'll provide bail and commissary and public relations assistance to activists who are arrested for acts of civil disobedience. So there's a mutual aid organization. I mentioned Free Aid, which is the organization I volunteer with, where we, we were providing medical help to people, volunteer medical, um, you know, first aid, basically, to people who are at various freedom-oriented events, like Porcupine Freedom Festival. We're going to be at Libertopia and Liberty Forum and a bunch of other smaller ones as well. And, you know, I hear a lot about private individuals making loans to one another here in New Hampshire, uh, people buying and selling precious metals, bartering for food and things like that, all kinds of stuff. So it's really happening here in New Hampshire. And I think that people, uh, the reason why I'm going through all of these examples of what I think of as mutual aid is because I think a, almost everybody participates in it in some form or another. And they're surprised to find that out sometimes. They think mutual aid is only limited to hospitals or is only limited to uh, financial institutions, but it's it's really not. It can extend to all different areas of life, like I said before, any kind of social service or social need. So there's a question in the chat that says, what do you think about religion's role in providing this type of support, hospitals specifically? And wow, that's a great question. Um, I'll answer it now. I was going to save questions to the end, but I think it's appropriate to, to answer this question. Um, I those of you who know me maybe listen to my podcast and radio show pork therapy or hear me on free talk live know that I am no fan of religion and that it can be an instrument of social control and a lot of the religious charities I think especially the hospitals like for instance there are Catholic hospitals that do not provide uh, birth control services to people who go there or to their employees and certainly do not provide abortions or anything like that and you know I think that uh, I may disagree with some of that, um, but there, there are still some services they can provide that are kind of secular and don't involve the religion, and there are lots of secular organizations that provide social services, and I think that's part of the kind of beauty of the free market is that there are tons of different mutual aid, or aid organizations. They're structured differently. Some are hierarchical, where there's like a board of directors who decides who gets the aid based on uh, different criteria. And some of them are really centralized where they're just a bunch of contributors and there's like a pool and it's, 
you know, it's more of a co-op style of, uh, of running the organization, um, and everything in between. And, you know, uh, there are also, like you were talking about, we, we were talking about religious and secular organizations. There are services that kind of provide, uh, I'm sorry, there are organizations that provide services and they may proselytize or some of them may be secular, but uh, I think the, the market kind of speaks in terms of them getting donations and them succeeding in terms of public relations. Uh, the market kind of speaks to uh, what people support in those respects. And I'm really glad to see that there are secular organizations uh, that provide mutual aid as well as religious ones. And a lot of people like to focus on the religious aspects, uh, and they say that, you know, there would be no charity that's done without relig religiosity, and that's patently not true. Um, while I was researching different mutual aid organizations, I came upon one of the most famous ones uh, in here, that's the Lions Club. And they're a service organization started by an entrepreneur, actually, in Chicago. And they they explicitly say that they are secular, and they do a lot of volunteer work, a lot of uh, mutual aid and charity. And, of course, um, you know, a lot of secular hospitals out there, the Shriners don't. Uh, I think they were um, started by an Arab organization, but they don't have any religious uh, component to them or to the people that they care for. Um, you know, free aid is... Is secular, of course, and uh, you know things like credit unions, like uh, daycare co-ops, um, those don't have any aspect of religiosity. And so I don't see uh, a society like some people do, where uh, mutual aid organizations kind of force people to be religious because the churches are the only ones who are offering help. I don't see that type of society at all in the world that we have today. And you know, historically, there may have been a bias towards religiosity in terms of uh, mutual aid organizations, but I think as time goes on, that's definitely changing. And uh, especially if we look at the examples of different aid organizations today. And I think the trend will continue towards sec secularism uh, as time goes on and people uh, become less and less religious in general. So, okay, so I've outlined a lot of different examples of mutual aid organizations, some that might be surprising to some people. They may not think of them as mutual aid. Um, but you can see that mutual aid has a really broad definition. And it, more importantly, I kind of touched on this before, uh, none of these organizations rely on force. And they're everything from um, really decentralized to very highly organized and hierarchical. They're everything from secular to religious. And they're everything from uh, very small providing services on a very small scale, like a daycare co-op uh, in a neighborhood or a neighborhood watch to on a very large scale, like a national chain of hospitals. So you can see that these mutual aid organizations are structured in many, many, many different ways. And I think that's really important because no individual or no one organization really knows the best way that they can help people, especially in every different realm of social needs, I guess you could say. And so it's important to have those market uh, forces acting to kind of ferret out the best ways to serve people in every different situation and in everything that they need in life when they need help. Um, and of course the government cannot do that. Not only do they claim a monopoly on the provision of these social services and protection services and justice and all that, but they also use force to fund themselves. And uh, you know, I think one of the problems that private mutual aid organizations have had historically is that it's really hard to compete with an organization that claims a monopoly and has unlimited funds because they have the unlimited use of other people's money. So just let that sink in when people say, oh, you know, private charity doesn't exist, it's not reliable. Well, it's really difficult to compete with a monopoly, and it's really difficult to compete with someone who has an unlimited supply of other people's money. And bring up that point and, you know, see how people react. So. As I mentioned before, I think that it's really important that there are a variety of mutual aid organizations that exist today and that are trying out different ways to provide their services because that's how we will find the best way to serve as many people's needs as we possibly can, is to have different organizations that are structured differently, trying out their ideas and seeing what works best. And, you know, I can't, uh, well, I'll get to this a little bit later, but I want to talk about uh, kind of mutual aid in the, in the context of activism. So here's my appeal to liberty activists out there. I think the best way that we can possibly uh, 
chip away at the state is to create mutual aid organizations that and and then help people and also be vocal about why the voluntary alternatives show that it's not necessary to have a state using coercion and funding its provision of those services because really mutual aid is the kind of activism and the kind of civil disobedience if it's breaking the law you know it's the kind of activism that nobody can disagree with you're helping your neighbors you're helping people lots of people already do it uh, in order to participate in mutual aid you don't need a huge community of liberty activists you can do it online you can do it with people who are not necessarily explicitly into liberty or may even be status I mean you can get together over a common purpose and form a neighborhood watch a daycare co-op um, join a credit union you know another kind of co-op you can join a volunteer medical association you can contribute you can send money to organizations that you think serve these goals of providing people voluntarily with uh, social services that are not the state so this is something that anybody can participate in no matter where they are no matter who they are and no matter who's around them it seems like a win-win um, strategy for advancing the cause of freedom and of course I said it's not only important to participate in mutual aid but it's also important to be vocal about it and to let other people know and start these conversations about why these services do not need to be provided by the state why why it's possible for individuals to get together and how they have done so historically and they continue to do so today and help each other out and I think that's really the way that uh, we are going to chip away at the state and you know it's a great conversation starter to talk about mutual aid you know every time someone brings up this argument of well if we didn't have a government who would provide these vital services to people who need them you can say well uh, here's one example I volunteer at such and such and it's really inspiring and amazing to uh, meet these people and get together and provide these services and you know speaking from experience I think a lot of people who are seeing this talk maybe at some point in their life have done some kind of volunteer work uh, something like that I think my video froze did it freeze shit <laughs> okay let's restart it 